This is the best moments of the Barbecue Central Show in 10 minutes or less. Ever wish you could re-listen to your favorite interview or segment? Do you enjoy hearing older shows for the first time in years? Then the best moments of the Barbecue Central Show in 10 minutes or less is just what you need. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the best moments of the Barbecue Central Show in 10 minutes or less. Today's show comes from July 14th, 2014. First segment today, Sterling Ball, Pitmaster, Big Papa Smokers. He is throwing around a ton of competition cooking tips. It's almost like a whole class. Uh, Meathead joins Greg in the second segment, and they are going to get into some chicken talk, a lot of chicken safety, something near and dear to my heart. With that said, let's get right to it. From July 15th, 2014, Greg, are you ready to go? Absolutely. All right, my first guest tonight, a captain of many industries, a successful pit master, rub and spice manufacturer, barbecue equipment retailer, and I'm proud to say newest partner to this show. So uh, let's go ahead and head over to the hotline, and let's welcome back pit master of Big Papa Smokers, Sterling Ball, joining me here on the show. Sterling, how are you, buddy? I'm fine. How you doing, my friend? Doing absolutely fabulous, Sterling. Appreciate you uh, making time for the show tonight. Um, you know, number of different topics that I wanted to hit with you. Um, I guess first, before we uh, start into all of that, uh, where were you cooking this past weekend? Um, Holbrook, Arizona. Holbrook, Arizona. Uh, in 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 terms of geography, uh, how does that relate to like a, a Phoenix or a Scottsdale or something along those lines? It's an hour time zone. It's like a nine-hour drive from California. It's a, it's a pretty big um, drive, but they benefit uh, pediatric organ transplants, which uh, is really close to my heart and my family. And it's just a town of people really trying hard. And it's um, it's usually 30, 35 teams, and this year it was only 18 teams. Wow. So quite a drop-off. Yeah, and it's something we're kind of seeing uh, geographically this year. Sterling Ball joining us here. Uh, BigPapaSmokers.com is the website if you want to check it out here while we're talking and see everything he's got going on. Uh, Sterling, in in regards to a competition season, let's say, uh, at the end of the year when you've finished your last contest and you look ahead to the next year, for instance, 2014, uh, how do you go and plan the schedule for this season? Is it something that... There are competitions that you just want to do regardless of how many teams. Do you look for the teams that have trended bigger numbers every year? How does it go for the Big Papa Smokers team? Okay, first of all, since I have other kind of things, other responsibilities and other jobs, uh, it it has to fit into my other work schedule first, and also has to fit in my family schedule. But we're we're sort of empty nesters, but. Things like Fourth of July and holidays are off limits because I spend a lot of time with my kids on those. So, and then I I want to have fun. I want to go where my friends are, and I also like um, I like the, you know I prefer to be in bigger contests. Uh, I try not to miss the royal. Uh, are Are you at all invested uh, in trying to? you know, win a team of the year uh, type of thing uh, with any sanctioning body. I mean, obviously you cook a lot of KCBS. Um, is that something that you, that you would ever fancy yourself making a run at? I mean, I, I would imagine given the amount of cooks that you have to do in order to really kind of qualify in that status, uh, that would be something that you would want to mentally and, and physically and financially prepare for uh, during the course of a competition season. Well, okay. First of all, you know, <laughs> You have to cook 40 times, really, to have a chance. And I just don't have that time. And, you know, those guys are great cooks. And the first of all, you got to got to prove yourself that you're that good a cook. But, no, it's, you know, I like to see where I end, end up. But, like, last year, you know, I, I cooked 22 contests. And, you know, I was just trying to get be in the top 10 in one category, and I managed to do that in four. This year, I'm trying to get into two, two categories. So I only use that as just a little, uh, sort of a little game. But, I, you know, uh, I'm not going to throw away enough contests, and I'm probably not good enough cook. 
you know, I mean, you've been doing the competition barbecue thing now, I guess, for uh, four years or so. You know, when you first got into it, fast forward to, you know, where we are today, uh, towards the middle of July in 2014. What are some of like the, the big changes of the barbecue landscape that you have seen since you've been in it? Okay, I can only speak personally. For, you know, I make one road trip or two road trips here outside of Southern California. I can tell you Southern California is still growing. Southern California is a lot less partying. Uh, Southern California is a lot of guys who's taken a lot of classes. Um, it, it's tougher than everybody thinks, and I know that there's guys laughing in the background at the shows. I mean, come on out and see. I mean, and, and the California teams that are traveling are doing better, but I think it's more serious, but I think it's harder. I think it's harder. Uh, there's more details you have to pay attention to. I think the flavor profiles might move at a little more rapid pace. Um, and I think the kind of ingredients you, you feel like you have to cook, whether you do or not, whether it's compart, direct, pork, or how do you like that plug, by the way, or, uh, you know, a strew wagon or snake river farms, um, you know, it's, which, which is all tying into, I'm sure it's a topic we're going to get into is the cost. So I think it's got more expensive. I think it's, it's, it's more detail oriented and I think it's more competitive. As far as, as as far as the detail is concerned that you had mentioned, do you think that uh, to a certain degree that ha- has taken away some of the funness of it and potentially it has uh, taken away some people that you know thought about getting into it and has kept them on the sideline? No, I, you know, I think everybody wants to be good, and I think the one thing with the Internet and classes is that if you want to get good, you can get good a lot quicker. And, you know, We've got the rubs, and it's amazing how many people buy a bottle of rub and send an email and want a class. <laughs> and, you know, we, we, we tell them generally what we do and what people do, but we also encourage them to go out there and, and mix it up yourself. Play around with the stuff. Come up with your own own stuff, you know. Uh, and we mean that in a respectful way. Part To me, part of the joy is out there, and I, I cook more probably than most people. I practice cook a lot. Sterling Ball joining me here on the show, pitmaster of Big Papa Smokers. So to that point, Sterling, if you do a lot of practice cooking yourself, and people are obviously going to come up to people that they see winning or, or higher in the standings, always trying to glean bits of information, tips and tricks and techniques and so forth. Uh, when you are landing on a flavor profile that you think is, is going to win. How long does it take you to craft that to, to where you feel it's something that if you're going to make a change, you would do it? Or uh, perhaps uh, on the opposite side of that, if you see categories starting to fall off a little bit, uh, how far are you waiting or how long are you waiting before you start to make uh, changes to, to write that ship? Okay. First of all, I think you've got to be objective. I think you have to not take it so personally. You're going to get bad judging results, but I'm going to tell you something. If five times in a row or three times in a row you think you cook great chicken and you didn't place where you want, it's obviously not the chicken the judges want to taste. So I'll give you a perfect example. After Long Beach, a big contest here, I was really upset because my chicken had missed three times in a row and I'd worked so hard on it. And uh, so what I did is I cooked 128 chicken breast out, chicken fries that week. And we've hit every week since because, you know, you got to listen to those results. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying there aren't problems in judging stuff, but usually if you're getting the same result from city to city and week to week, you got to make an adjustment. And the judges are usually right. So let's talk about that adjustment just for a second. And this maybe is more of a benefit for the uh, peripheral people that, that might kind of track some barbecue competitions, but they don't really follow it, uh, or maybe they're not into it. When you talk about making a change, you know, if you're getting scores that aren't reflective of maybe where you think it is, and as you said, you got to listen to what the judges are saying, start making changes. Where do you start first? Do you start cooking longer? Do you start cooking shorter? Do you start tweaking flavors? I mean, there's so many different variables that go into changing something for a judge. It, it's got to be almost... Uh, uh, intimidating to a point to figure out where you should start to make those changes. Well, I mean, and that's the funny thing when you watch people overcorrect or oversteer um, and then get kind of teams that were doing really well and then 
kind of get whacked out because they didn't go. You, you you look at, I mean, like David Qualls can tell you what his scoring average in in each city, each region, each category, <laughs> each meet. He studies that very carefully. Works very hard. Very smart cook. See. I'm just hoping places in order after all this butting, buttering up. But look, if, if you're getting a tenderness problem, okay, if your scores or tenderness are costing you, or if it's flavor that's not hitting, or if it's appearance, appearance, you can play with how well you're trimming, how well you're putting in the box, what the color is, what the shine is. If you're getting a tenderness issue, it's a temperature issue usually. To put in your request for a future show, please contact John Solberg via email at John, J-O-N, at the BBQCentralShow.com. Hey, before we kick off the second segment, I got a question for you. Are you following the Barbecue Central Show on social media? It is easy to do and much appreciated. Whatever your favorite platform is, you can go to BBQ Central Show on Instagram or at BBQ Central Show on Facebook and Twitter. Again, very much appreciated. Give the big show a follow. That said, let's jump right into the second segment today. Uh, right. Meathead Goldwyn joining we're, us we're here. here to t- I am, today I am a tete de viande. I am the head of, be- of, anim- uh, of meat. I am uh, uh, here talking about the, uh, the national dish of France, but everybody loves chicken. Everybody eats chicken. Um, and if time permits, we'll talk some about duck and goose and turkey. Uh, so where's a, a good place to start? I mean, poultry is obviously a vast subject. Chicken is a vast subject on its own. Uh, is it something that we want to start with, uh, you know, uh, when it grows up and how it's slaughtered about and, and then it uh, gets to the table? I mean, do we want to start with safety stuff? Where do we want to, to run? I think we've, let's start with safety because yeah. anything we say about chicken – has to be underscored by the fact that the modern method of factory farming chicken um, is uh, uh, very efficient. It gets us chicken at a very cheap price. Um, uh, it create it gets protein on the market at rock bottom prices, um, but it, it it is potentially hazardous. This is a factory line moves very fast. They take the chickens. They dunk them in water to be to to, to get the 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 feathers out. Uh, they dunk them in water again to rinse them clean. Um, uh, and it, once that water gets contaminated with, with poop, then that poop gets transferred from bird to bird. Um, in February this year, just this year, Consumer Reports cover story um, uh, reported that they went around the country and bought 300 plus chicken breasts. And they tested them all for microbes. And uh, of the 306, I think they tested, 90% had pathogenic microbes like salmonella and E. coli. And of those, half of them had antibiotic-resistant microbes. (laughs) So the lesson here is, is we've got to start with safety. You have to cook chicken care carefully and safely. You have to handle it safety, safely. The current wisdom is, is you don't wash it. When you wash it, you spatter, you spray, and you aerosolize um, uh, whatever is on the skin. And if that is bad, guys, um, it gets on the dish drain and on the sink uh, back and the, uh, and, and, and the uh, knobs on the sink. And so the current wisdom is, is you just unwrap it. And um, uh, you prep it for cooking. You wipe down the counters thoroughly with a, with a uh, cleanser, hopefully with a chlorine base. You treat chicken like kryptonite. Um, you treat it like it's potentially poisonous. You don't let it sit in the refrigerator above vegetables where it can drip. Um, you double bag it. Um, uh, and if you treat it with respect and you handle it carefully, it's a great meal. Um, and it can be really tasty. Um, but if you slip up and you goof up, somebody's going to get a tummy ache or worse, and it can be worse. Do you think that there would ever be a time, this is going to be ludicrous for me to say, of course, but with all of the care, and, and maybe a lot of people don't really, well, let me ask you to speculate if you could or pontificate if you could. What, what percentage of, of people do you think are completely unaware of 
how potentially hazardous chicken can be when not even handled in a somewhat respectable manner? You know, the population of America covers such broad range of depth and breadth, racial and ethnic, educational. Um, I think a lot has been said publicly. It's been in the news. It's been in the newspapers. It's talked about. But if you don't read the newspapers, if you don't speak English, if you are not watching the 6 o'clock news, it may have escaped you. And it may be an issue. And um, the uh, CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, has something they call the Morbidity Report. I think it comes out weekly. And it reports outbreaks. And um, salmonella poisoning from chicken is fairly common. Um, uh, I don't think I've ever had it, but I've had some pretty god-awful tummy aches. And I know everybody listening has at one time or another. That so-called 24-hour flu is not the flu. It's another virus, and it's usually some sort of norovirus or uh, food poisoning. Uh, we used to call it food poisoning. Now it's called foodborne illness is the new politically correct term. Do you think that there might be a faction of people that know and go, well, it's just, it's just not going to happen to me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we call yeah. those people stupid where I come from. hey yo. <laughs> I, I mean, you, you just you, you do the best you can. You try. I mean, um, we know that, for example, on the barbecue circuit, uh, we've talked about this before. Um, we've, we, we don't need to get into it because it's complicated and take a long time. We want to talk about cooking. Yeah. But killing microbes, um, USDA and all the scientists say um, uh, you take chicken up to 165. Well, it, at 165, it takes seven seconds to pasteurize. It's not sterilize, it's pasteurize. It's right. a minor difference. Right. To, ster- to pasteurize the chicken. Well, that's seven seconds. But at 160, it takes like a minute. And at 155, it's like five minutes or so. I forget the exact numbers. There's a table that they produce. They don't tell you about it because it's complicated. So you can actually cook chicken to a lower temperature. But if you hold it at that temperature for a while or if it's gradually moving up. So you can remove chicken at a lower temperature. And we know the competition cooks are starting to do this. We also know, and, and, and it bears a good deal of risk, uh, we also know that all your cookbooks are wrong about, um, they all say, cook until the juices run clear. Yeah. Um, and we've talked about this very briefly, but it bears repeating. Um, uh, the juices of the chicken used to, ta- chickens used to take longer to grow. These new breeds, um, they're on the market within two months. And what happens is, is the ends of the bone, like at that place where the drumstick meets the thigh, that joint yep. is one of the, most tender and delicate and uh, coldest parts of the bird, that bone end has not calcified properly in such a young bird. It hasn't hardened over. And the insides of the bone is where blood is made. And although the blood is drained from the chicken, occasionally you see a little vein or artery in there, but the ends of the bone are often bloody. And you'll cut into those things. And I've done it, and perhaps your readers who cook, and, and, and all, I, I presume most of your readers have digital thermometers now. They know how to cook. Um, you, you can cook it up to 180, and you know it's 180. You know yeah. it's safe. Yeah. And you cut that bird open, and you look at the thigh, and yeah, your freak. wife says, I'm putting it in the microwave. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, right. it's 180. It's safe. It's pink. It's yeah. bloody. Yeah. Um, it's scary. And, and you know, I know I've cooked chicken at 155 and I know it's safe and I've done it right. I've done it carefully with all the instruments that I have. And when I see pink chicken, it still gives me the, G- the heebie-jeebies. I'm just still a little nervous well, about it. I so. think it's been so pounded into your head for, it's not just years, but decades, that it, just the, the visual appearance of it, as you said, huh? you know everything's fine. You know you did it right, but when you see it, you're like, yeah, maybe I didn't. I don't have problems with a little pink in my in my pork. No, me neither. But when I see pink in my chicken, it's like, ew. <laughs> it's, a, well, it's an issue. When you have people that run the most heavily trafficked barbecue and grilling website saying you should treat chicken like kryptonite, you're probably going to be a little skittish. Yeah. yeah. But don't stop cooking chicken. No. And I, cook it well. Cook it properly. And I'm going to suggest, as we get into cooking technique in a short bit, um, some techniques that will help guarantee safety. 
And there is a handful of best moments from July the 15th, 2014. Every one of Greg's shows are just chock full of best moments. So head over to the bbqcentralshow.com. Listen to the rest of the show. Sterling's got a lot more tips. And Meathead, as always, is full of information. While you're over at the main website, do me a favor. Subscribe to the Barbecue Central Show via podcast. Never miss an episode of this show or the really big show again. Thank you so much for checking it out. Until next time, I am your host, John Solberg. I look forward to talking to you again soon.